talking about proportions, and this was a proportion problem. We were talking about what proportion or percentage of the package would be delivered on time. When we are writing our claims, null hypothesis, alternative hypothesis, the null hypothesis for proportions is always going to look like this. P equals something. So every time, if we are running through this proportions hypothesis test, your null hypothesis should say P equals point. Okay, and we'll talk about what that number is in a second. The alternative hypothesis, we can write it in three different ways. Because remember, this is what we suspect is happening. Well, if P doesn't equal whatever this number is, the alternative would be P is less than this number. Greater. We could say P is greater than this number. Yep. Or, or divide. we could just say P is not equal to this number. Um, I'm just going to call this C, just to put something there. It's just or a number, right? But it's the same number. Oh, that is here, just here, too here. easy. So when you are writing your hypotheses, is it? the null hypothesis should always be P equals something. And again, that's what like the claim is, or what we think, or what the status quo, nothing has changed, everything is as advertised. David, is your question? Yeah, I don't think that makes any sense, but um, can page all can equal to page A sometimes? No, never. Well, if it does, we're not, like, we do all this stuff and we wouldn't get to anything at the end. Yeah. So we do want two different things, because what we're trying to do is figure out which of them is true. Can we say that the alternative is true? Do we have enough evidence to say that? So they do, they, and they're going to be, they're going to be standing in opposition to each other. We're going to say either P is this, or P is less than and um, how you choose which of these to use depends on kind of the question setup. Um, just a second, Ava. These first two options, P less than, P greater than, we call those one-sided hypotheses, one-sided alternative hypotheses. And then this third one, the P is not equal to, we call that a two-sided. Does that make sense why I would call those one-sided versus two-sided? Because mm -hmm. for the one side that I'm saying it's greater than, or I could say it's less than, for the not equal to, could be greater than or less than. So okay. it's both. So one sided versus yeah. two sided. Mm -hmm. Okay, Ava, did you have a question? Yeah, I have a question about option three. Why, what's the difference between like greater or less and then not, you know, the, the sign? So when we write ours out, we're choosing one of these. I know, like, what's the difference? Like, we already looked for like, Greater or less, so this is these are going to be a little stronger. So my conclusion might be, oh, I have evidence that uh, the percentage of people with a passport is less than fifty percent. That's saying something different than I have evidence that the percentage of people with a passport is not fifty percent. That's the difference. Yeah, that's so, so like the option two would be like not fifty percent. Like option two here, example? this is greater than. I know, but less according than, to your example. Not equal to. So. so let's look at our example. Okay. So looking at this again, the package delivery service is claiming that the percentage of packages they deliver is 90%. So my null hypothesis is going to be P equals what's 90% of the proportion? 0.9. Okay. So for our package delivery example, our null hypothesis is P equals 0.9. When they're running through hypotheses tests, usually this is going to be like the claim that's out there by this business, right? They're saying it's 90%, so we're going to say, okay, we're going to believe you, but then we're going to see if this evidence actually like backs you up or gives me cause to disbelieve you. Now, the alternative is either going to be P is less than 0.9, P is greater than 0.9, or P is just not equal to 0.9. And how you choose the right one is you have to go back and look at like, well, what what is this probably competitor or customer trying to, what do they think is happening? What are they trying to show? If we look at this, do we suspect that it's less than 90%, more than 90%, or are we just interested in not equal to 90%? Hmm. So it's less, than. less than. So this case, we are thinking, I don't actually believe they deliver 90%, we think it's less than. So for this problem, we would set up our alternative hypothesis as P, less than 0.9. If in this problem it said, is this enough information to support the claim that the actual percentage of packages delivered on time is not equal to instead of less than, then that would
that would change my alternative hypothesis. If it said more than, that would change my alternative hypothesis. So how you choose how to set this guy up, you're gonna have to read through your example or your question really carefully, right? Yay, reading. Okay, so in our case, our null hypothesis in words is that, no, the company is correct, 90% of the packages are delivered on time. The alternative hypothesis in words is basically, uh, the company is kind of lying or misrepresenting what actually happens. Whatever percentage of packages get delivered on time is less than 90%. So we're not saying it is 80%. We don't know, right? We're just saying it's something that is significantly less than 90%. So then we can kind of call it that. Like, hmm, this statistic is not accurate with what you're doing. Okay? So for every hypothesis test, or for proportion, step one is going to be read through the question probably a couple times. Write our null hypothesis, p equals some number, some proportion. Alternative, p less than, p greater than, or p not equal to. And if you read through the problem carefully, you should be able to figure out which one we're using here. Again, the alternative is what we're trying to show is the case, right? Someone is saying this thing is happening, but we think something else is happening. What is that thing we think might be happening we're trying to show? Okay, so that's step one. We have our example. Or step two. Right. Step two, we skipped over last week. <clears throat> Step two is where we collect the data. Now for us, we don't have to collect the data because we're not paying to get data in a statistic, right? But step two, we are going to summarize the data. Okay. Now, as with everything in statistics, for me to trust any of this, my data has to come from a representative sample. So like in the background of everything, I need to know that my sample was collected in a fair way, it's not biased, it's representative. So this is still going on in the background. But in step two, what we're going to be doing is we are going to be taking the data from the sample. Again, someone else collected it, we don't have time to go out and get some data. Someone else took this data from a sample, and we are going to try to use a formula, come up with a formula, to get this thing called a test statistic. And what a test statistic is, is let me write down this definition. This is gonna be, it's a number, so this is a value that we calculate from the sample data. That we will use to reject or, it's two words, not reject, the null, or we can also use it to support versus not support the alternative, right? At the end of this whole thing, we're going to either reject the null, support the alternative, or if our evidence isn't strong enough, we're going to not reject the null, not support the alternative. And I do have that sheet I promised last week with sentence helpers that I will hand out before you leave. So this should help you write your conclusions. I get that. Kind of some, like standard way I'll be supporting everything. Yeah. Okay. I think I don't want to talk about this. I step get two. Now, step two here. This is where the test for proportions and the test for means are going to be different. So today we're going to use a slightly different formula to come up with this test statistic number. On Wednesday, when we're looking at, instead of proportions, we're looking at means, we'll have a different formula. But again, these aren't things we have to memorize. These are just things we have to know how to use and how to choose the right one. Okay. All right. What the test statistic is, the test statistic is going to help us get that p-value in step three. But what the test statistic is, is it's kind of like the z-score. It is a form of the z-score. It tells me how far away my sample proportion is from whatever proportion we're testing. So what the test statistic is, and this will help kind of understand where this comes from, the test statistic measures how far uh, p hat, which is, we didn't forget this all over a couple days off, sample proportion, right? How far p hat is from, and now I'm going to use a symbol, a new symbol, P with this little O. I have this in the reading, right? This is called the null proportion. Um, but basically, this is just whatever number we're testing in our hypothesis. Okay? So this is saying, how far away is our sample proportion 
from the proportion we're testing. So this is that thing I wrote in step one. P equals, in this case, our null proportion is point. Okay? So this is just the proportion we are testing. Okay? So let's actually go back to our example and figure out, we know the null proportion is just 0.9. Okay? So for our example, the null proportion, again, this is just the proportion that we used in our null hypothesis. So for, in our case, this is 0 0.9. How would I, or can we, do we have enough information to come up with the sample proportion? Yeah. Yeah. How would we do that? Uh, how, uh, 192 divided by 225. Okay, yeah. Because we know out of our sample of 225, 192 were delivered on time. So go ahead and use your calculator. For this hypothesis test, what is our sample proportion? going to be 192 out of 225, and let's get at least three places. 0.8, 8, 5, 8, 5, 3, 3. 8, 5, 3. And someone else, can we get a confirmation? A second? 8, 5, 3. We all agree on that? 8, 5, 3. Okay, great. Thank you. Uh, okay, so we want to know, basically, what we're saying is this sample proportion, this is below the 0.9, right? What I want to know is, is that far enough below, basically, to give me evidence that, strong evidence, and evidence enough to like call this packaging company for false advertising, is this enough evidence for me to say, you do not deliver 90% of your packages on time, right? That's a lie. That's what we're trying to do. Okay, so in our example, if I just subtracted uh, the no minus the sample or the other way around, that would tell me how far apart those two numbers are, correct? Oh, yeah. So yeah. if I did, going back to our little notes page, if I just did 0.853 minus 0 0.9, that's going to be a negative number because it's below, right? Negative 0.047, I think, right? So what I'm doing here is I'm just subtracting and I get 0 0.047. It's negative because our sample is below the 0.9, right? So this just says this is 0 0.047. What's Let's check the 192 divided by 225, 0.853, okay, sure about that. All right, so this just means that our p hat is 0 0.047 below the null proportion. That's all that means. We subtract, we're finding the distance. Um, however, yes. Can you, uh, can you please repeat the last sentence? You said like other proportions that is below. So our sample proportion is 0 0.047, which I got by subtracting, no. below this 0.9. All I did was subtract to find a distance, right? If it was positive, I would say, oh, it's above the 0.9. So our PO is 90%? 9, uh, 9 0.9, yes. The PO is the thing we're testing against in your hypothesis, correct. Okay, now, this, this is a distance, but I didn't take into account like how big my sample size was, right? Because if, if I found this distance in a sample of 10 packages versus a sample of like 10,000 packages, those would kind of mean different things, right? I need to somehow take the sample size into account. And so basically, in the reading, they get more into the like weeds on where this all comes from. But if we take what we know about the sampling distribution for sample proportions. So this looks vaguely familiar. I know it's been a while, right? But we've seen this before. And we take the way we find a z-score, which where was x minus mu over sigma. If we combine all that, and again, this isn't something we have to do on our own, but I'm just telling you where this formula comes from. If we combine what we know about a z-score and the sampling distributions, we come up with the formula we can use. So this, I'm going to start because this is what you are interested in. This is the formula we use to find this test statistic. So step one, write the claims. Step two, find the test statistic. So this is what the formula we're going to use. We are doing p hat, sample proportion, minus p null. That's the p we're testing in our null hypothesis. Right. All over square root p null, one minus p null over n. So again, combining these things up here, we come up with this formula, okay? You don't have to memorize this, but I would like circle it in your notes because you're gonna wanna use this when you're going through the homework and when you're working on your take home quiz. Okay, this is what we're gonna do in step two. So notice, we have to know 
three things to use this formula. I have to know the null proportion, that's what we're testing against. I have to know the sample proportion, and I have to know the sample size. But once we know all of that, this is just going to be a very careful plugging into our calculator, correct? Okay. What this tells me, this is going to tell me the distance in standard deviations of the sample proportion to the null proportion. So we're going to get a test statistic out. And this is the same thing we were finding with those z-scores. When we got a z-score of 2.5, that meant that our number was 2.5 2.5 standard deviations above the mean. It's the same idea here. If I get a z-score, a test statistic of 2.5, that means that sample fee is 2.5 standard deviations above the null. Right? Mm -hmm. It's the same idea, yes. Okay. So on the quiz, can I just like put this when you Please. ask for explanation? Because you just said mm -hmm. <clears throat> this whole thing says that it's about the distance instead of the deviations. So I don't really ask you for an explanation here. Well, if I did, you could say, yes, this means it's blah, 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 blah above the mean. What kind? Where you're going to have to explain is the end, which is the conclusion. Okay, so let's, for our example, which was, where did it go? Here. We know all these things, right? Correct? Yes. Yeah. We know P hat. We know P null was 0.9. Yeah. We know the sample size was 225. Yeah. So let's go ahead and make sure we can all practice doing this on our calculators and see if we can all get the same number. So let me just write down everything we know. So we're trying to use this formula. I can't. I can't do. I can't do. Okay. Mm -hmm. So in our case, what I need to carefully, either in one step or multiple steps, p hat is 0.853, p null is 0.9, and then all the square root is on the bottom. 0 0.9, whoops, 0.9, 1 minus 0 0.9 over what was our sample size? 225? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. When you put this in your calculator, you need parentheses around the top. So let's take a minute and let's make sure we are all getting the same test statistic. So parentheses 0.853 minus 0.9. Close my parentheses. Square root. Make sure that uh, denominator, all of that stuff is inside the square root. So again, you can do it in a couple steps if you're having a hard time doing this all in one step on your calculator. But if you put parentheses around the top, you can also do this on your calculator. I got negative 2.35. I got also negative 2.35. So if you're getting something else, uh, check your calculator usage. But what we should get, our test statistic is negative 2.35. So for these hypothesis tests, at the end of our step two, because we're still on step two, we're going to come up with a number. This is test statistic. OK. Now. What this means in terms of our example, this means that our sample proportion from that 225 package sample is 2.35 standard deviations below the 0.9 they're advertised percentage of delivery. That? Yes. What this means is that our sample proportion, 0.853, is 2.35 standard deviations below because it's negative, right? Below the mean, the 0.9, the null proportion. I got lost. The sample proportion, uh -huh. p hat, yeah. is 2.35 standard deviations below the null proportion. <coughs> That's what that number represents. Hmm. Our standard, standard proportion is p, all right? Sample proportion is p hat. 2.35 standard deviations. Below the null proportion, which is 0.9. There's my sentence. Okay. Um, to do all of this, remember if we think back to topic five, we still need a big enough sample for proportions. And this is good finals of you, because um, the finals coming up. For proportions, our rules were n times p had to be at least 10, and then n times 1 minus p had to be at least 10. So I'm not going to make you do this on your quiz, but just be aware, these two things still have to be true in order to like run through this whole hypothesis test. So this is kind of going on in the background. Now if we check this, n is 225, or null p is 0.9, these are both going to be way bigger than 10. So yes, our sample is big enough, this whole thing is valid. Okay, now, that's step two. Again, 
This Who's usually doesn't take so long because we don't have to like explain where the whole formula comes from. Usually we use our information, we use this formula, we come out with our test statistic. That is step two. So step one, write our two claims. Step two, use the formula, find our test statistic. Now we're going to move on to step three. Okay, step three, we have to find that p-value. Yes. Can uh, like if we check that n times p is greater or equal ten, and the other one, and then it's but in this in the uh, in the problem it says it's a normal shape, like you know. That's for means. <coughs> oh, that's for means. Okay. Yeah. <coughs> so that's for Wednesday. Yes, I understand your question. That's for means. Okay, so we're gonna move on to step three. <coughs> and I'm gonna remind you of what we talked about last Monday. It was so long ago. Step three is finding this thing called the p-value. And so we have to remember what the p-value is. The p-value is a probability, and what the p-value is is we're saying, okay, assume the null is true. We're going to give this package company the benefit of the doubt and assume they're not lying to us. We're going to say, okay, I believe you. If you actually deliver 90% of your packages on time, how likely is it that I just randomly chose a sample where only 85% of them got delivered? So the p-value is value is, because this is important to understand because this will help you write your conclusions, P value. The probability. probability, so it's a probability, so it should be between which two numbers? Zero, Zero and one. If you get something other than that, something's gone wrong, it's a probability. So the p-value is the probability of observing the test statistic we just found or something more extreme. And that more extreme thing will make sense when I show you a couple pictures. Assuming the null is true. So the whole hypothesis test, we say the null is true, the null is true, the null is true, unless I get enough evidence to basically say no. I have evidence to reject the null, and then if we reject the null, we can support the alternative. Okay. So what the p-value is, is it is the probability of getting this sample data and this test statistic we just got, assuming the null is true, and Ooh, the thing Jesus. we need to know is the smaller the p-value, the stronger our evidence is against the null. multiply it by 2 to get to both of these. 
or we can get it on stack crunch, Great. Okay. this area off the table and multiply it by two. If you draw a picture before you get your p-value and make sure you know, do I want this little left tail, do I want this little right tail, or do I need both of them? That should help you make sure you are actually getting the correct probability out of stack crunch or out of your table. Okay, so our alternative hypothesis was p, whoops, p less than, right? This is what we were trying to show, right? We don't need to believe the packing company. We think that their delivery percentage is less than 0 0.9. We got a test statistic. Let me actually throw this on here. Okay. So our alternative hypothesis was P less than 0 0.9. Our test statistic was negative 2.35, right? Is that correct? Okay. So if I draw my picture, Negative 2.35 is below the mean, correct? So this is negative 2.35. I want the area to the left because it's less than. Couldn't we just look this up on our table? Mm -hmm. Okay, so you might have your table, that's okay. If we look up negative 2.35 on the table, I'm getting about 0 0.0094. That's my p value. I'm also gonna do this on stat crunch because I'm assuming that the work you're most of you doing this on stat crunch, but just be aware you can still use the table. Stat crunch is a little more accurate. So if we go to stat crunch here, how do we get to that normal thing? We can forget everything. Stat, calculators, normal. And remember here we can change everything. I wanted less than negative 2.35. And we got 0.009386. Well, we got 0 0.0094 from the table, right? Mm -hmm. So notice stat crunch can confirm what we got from the table. Again, I'm kind of expecting you will mostly use stat crunch to find your p values. That's why we have stat crunch to save ourselves time. Um, we still have the table. There will be, you know, one or two questions on the final on the no stat crunch part with the table. So don't like completely put the table out of your minds. But on this quiz and on this homework, Use stack crunch. You paid what thirteen dollars for it. We're gonna use it to help ourselves out. Okay, that's like multiple copies. All right. So let's write that down. So we found our p value of 0 0.009386. Okay. Or if we use the table, we just had 0 0.0094. Correct. This is step three. Step three should end with us getting this probability out. Sorry. This is step three. So step three. Step four, back to the hard part. Well, it's all pretty hard. Step four is where we have to write our conclusions, okay? And there are two parts to this step, and then I'll hand up the sheet to hopefully help you write your conclusions. Okay. Step one is we have to look at our p-value and basically decide, is that small enough, right? And this is where we compare it to that alpha. So here, we say, based on the p-value, Is our evidence strong enough? Or we could also say, is our evidence significant? So here is where you decide, is that P small enough to say that, yes, these results are significant. Yes, our evidence is strong enough to do all the blah, 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 step two, right? And how we decide here is we say, if the P value is less than alpha, Either alpha is given or the standard is alpha is 0 0.05. If the p-value is smaller than alpha, then we would say yes. Our results are significant, our evidence is strong enough. Then we have to, this is the part I'm really going to watch out for, that you guys are going to do a great job at. We have to write out our sentence, state your results in the context of the problem. So, saying, I reject H little o is not going to get you full points for me on the quiz and on the final. What I'm looking for, and I was thinking this morning of like a good way to explain to you what I want, pretend like you were a researcher who was working for like this company, okay? So they're, they don't know statistics, so they're paying you to like do our analysis. If I walked up to this man who hired me and I said, okay, I did your hypothesis test and I reject H little o and I accept H big A. He would be like, what the heck did I pay you for? That means nothing to him, right? But if I walk up to him and I say, okay, we have enough evidence to uh, discredit the claim that 90% of the packages 
arrive on time. And support the claim that it's actually less than 90%, that's something you can use, right? So when I say in the context of the problem, that is what I'm looking for. Pretend you are working for someone who does not know anything about HO and HA. How would you explain what we know to them? Okay. All right. Let me hand this out right now. This is your help sheet for, I'll put it up here, formulating your conclusions. And so what I have here that you can use on your homework, you can use on any quiz from here on out. And I think I'll just let you keep it next to you for the final. So try not to lose it. Or if you're really good at writing conclusions, you can lose it. That's fine. But if P is less than A, here are four different ways to write a good conclusion sentence with just a fill in the blank with whatever your alternative is or whatever your null is. If P is greater than A, that means we don't have enough evidence. Here are four different ways to write that conclusion. Are there other ways? Yes, but these are the most common, like on StatCrunch, and these are going to be probably the easiest to understand when you're writing out your own conclusions. So I have this for you guys. Hand them out. Um, and then, when, as I'm handing this out, think about a sentence we could write 